Welcome, Vistage members and guests. I'm Dave Nelson, a 13-year member in the Pittsburgh area, part of CE676, and your Fridays with Vistage host. Hey, it's better than a regular April 15th because depending on where you are, you still have another three or four days to get your taxes done. Today, we're talking about the 2016 economic paradox, where we're headed and what to do. And we have two great guests to address this topic. Art Saxby is the CEO of Chief Outsiders, and, well, we were going to have Brian Bolio, but we've been able to make a major upgrade here at the last minute to his twin brother, Alan Bolio, president of ITR Economics. So, Art, uh, welcome. And, Alan, uh, I'm right about the upgrade, correct? We'll take that as a yes. Now, let me introduce our, uh, our two guests here. Art Saxby founded Chief Outsiders in 2009. It's now the country's largest strategic growth implementation company focused on mid-sized businesses. Chief Outsiders allows growing companies to add market-focused senior executives to their leadership teams when the cost or complexity of full-time employees, uh, um, executive hires do not make sense. Saxby started his career in corporate finance with roles at LTV Aerospace and Defense and Frito-Lay, and he learned his trade in marketing at Frito-Lay, Kellogg's, Coca-Cola, and Compaq HP. Art is the co-author of the Amazon best-selling book, The Growth Years. And if you're watching on your computer, you're hearing me on the telephone but seeing video, the same will be true for Art. Our other guest today is Dr. Alan Bolio, one of the country's most informed economists and a principal of ITR Economics where he serves as president. Since 1990, he's been consulting with companies throughout the U.S., Europe, and Asia on how to forecast, plan, and increase their profits based on business cycle trend analysis. That's what we're going to be talking about today. Alan is also the senior economic advisor to NAW, contributing editor for Industry Week, and the chief economist for Hardy, which is a major industry association in the HVAC space. Alan is the co-author, along with his brother Brian, of the books Prosperity in the Age of Decline, read it, loved it, by the way, and make your move. Now, if you have questions during the webinar, please type them in the WebEx Q&A panel. We'll answer as many as we can, but not until the end. And in formulating your questions today, I want to encourage you to keep your focus on, for example, what to do in a given situation rather than on the specifics of economic forecasting and predictions. So with that, uh, Art, Alan, let's get rolling. All right, thank you very much. Well, very excited to be here today. Uh, We've got some great information for you, and I'm actually very excited to have Alan on the line with us. Um, We work very closely with ITR and and, um, both Brian and Alan. Um, We were able to upgrade to the A-team today, which is personally great for me because we were scheduled to have the funny one, and quite frankly, I don't need that kind of competition. So today we've got the smart one. All the better. All right. (laughs) You know he's going to get you for that, Art. (laughs) (laughs) Today we're going to talk about the economic paradox. Um, What does 2016 look like? But more importantly, what are we going to do about it? This isn't an economic update looking at the details of the economy and what's what's moving. This is more going to be a a workshop looking at what do we do with that information? Because many companies do get whipsawed by the economy. They get a tailwind and they're they're pushed forward. They get a headwind and they're they're stopped. What we're going to look at today is how how do we as business leaders do something about that. So we'll start out with some information. We need to provide some good tools and some insights to help you understand what is happening in the economy. How do you evaluate what's happening in your company? How do you evaluate your own company and your your propensity to to grow or react? Then look at what type of information can you get about specific types of of things. How do you get information about what's going to happen economically to your customers? Then what do you do differently? So the real focus is going to be a bit of information up front because we need the information and the understanding to make decisions. Then we'll actually go through the four phases of the economy and say, you know, when you and your customers are in phase A, what are the types of things you need to watch out for? What are the types of things you should be doing? So let's go ahead and get into this. Alan? Sure, I'd be happy to. ITR Economics, our firm, is steeped in long-term business cycle theory, and we're not getting into a a lot of theory today. Uh, Suffice to say that it is unique to ITR. Our founder, Chapin Hoskins, deserves the academic credit. My brother and I are just continuing his work and his studies. We overlay the 
theoretical base with a strong look at leading indicators using rate of change. And we're going to get into both of those as we go through this, uh, this webinar. And while our head is always out the window, if you're looking out the window, if you will, at news sources and what's actually happening in the world, it's easy in economics to get into the numbers and forget that there's a reality out there. So we use a three-legged stool, reality, leading indicators, and uh, theory to drive our forecast accuracy, which, as you know, Art, is, is best in industry, 94.7% 12 months into the future. has been that way for 30 years. Uh, last year was closer to 98%. It was a fantastic year for us. And using that methodology, our clients and uh, our mutual clients have a way of anticipating what is coming, crafting the right message, and getting the right message to the right people at the right time. As opposed to just being reactive, they become entirely proactive to how they run their business. And you begin to look at the world differently when you can see around the corner. Uh, if you can take us down to the next uh, point, please, Art. Uh, next one, please. Uh, we have a product called the ITR Trends Report, and in that Trends Report, uh, there's an executive summary, which you see a page of here. We have uh, numerous industries. Um, there are ways that you can see what samples look like, and, and we can get to that later. But what, what I want you to see here is that the, the blue line down at the bottom, which are actual results, we're tracking with the dotted red line, which was the forecast, life is good. The important thing for you to note here is that it never moves in a straight line. And that's probably the most dangerous thing people do is they start getting into straight line thinking. When things are going down, we tend to think it'll just continue down until we're, you know, until we actually feel the change. And uh, then it's too late. We, when we're feeling a change, we're well past the preparation point. And when things are going up, we want to believe they're just going to continue to go up. And that's why whole economies, groups of people, industries, businesses all step off the cliff at the same time is because we fall victim to straight line forecasting. We want to change that. We want to make sure that all of our listeners here today have a way of seeing into the future and anticipating those changes and adjusting accordingly. Next, please. So, Brian, Brian before we or move Alan, on to that. Whichever one you prefer. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Alan. <laughs> before we move on to that, I just realized this is a page from the January 2006 issue and in January 2006, you were forecasting a downturn in the economy in, in 8, 9, and 10. That, that's pretty amazing. Well, thank you. Uh, yes, we were. Uh, you know, that train wreck was pretty easy. Well, I don't want to say it was easy to see coming, but using the right tools, uh, some of which we're looking at today, uh, the, the economy signals what's going to be happening. You just have to know where to look, and that's what we do here at ITR Economics. Uh, thanks for pointing that out, Art. Very nice of you. Uh, the first tool that we're going to look at today is the development of rate of change. What you see on the screen in front of you is a monthly data trend. And if you look at that monthly data trend, uh, you may be able to discern a pattern. You may not. It's often very difficult to do that. It's, a, it's something the eye doesn't do really well when there aren't that big changes in the numbers. But when we go to the, and if you go down uh, here, Art, we go to the three-month moving total, now a pattern develops. If this is your company's sales, and let's assume it's in millions, we've gone from $4.4 million in over a three-month period back in 2013 to $5.3 million today. Obviously, our company is growing. We look at the trend line in between, and it's uh, been fairly consistent growth. And that's all we know at this point is that we're growing. We don't know for how long we'll be growing or at what rate we'll be growing. We just know that we have been, past tense. Next one, please. So we convert that to a rate of growth. So we begin to see into the future. And the next one again, we do a year-over-year -year comparison, and the math is shown there on the screen for you, and we come up with the quarterly growth rate. It's called a 3 over 12 rate of change. I know this is not exciting, by the way, but it's just necessary so we can get the most out of seeing into the future. We have a quarterly growth rate that is slowing down. It's all, also all we know. We don't know why yet. We'll find out, but all we know now is that our company's growth rate is slowing. And then if we want to smooth it out some more, we go to a 12-month moving total, see that we have been growing. We're now a $20 million company on an annual run rate. We were $18 million a year ago. Uh, we convert that to a 12 over 12 rate of change using a year-over-year -year comparison. Which if you go to the next slide, Art. We can see that our growth rate has slowed to 12.7% from 26.7%. So as a company, our annual growth rate has slowed very noticeably. And obviously, every leader wants to know why. I mean, that's the most reasonable question on earth. Why am I slowing down? I think if we go to the next slide, we're going to see there are four reasons why you're going to slow down. One is the economy doing it to you. Most obvious reason. 
uh, except if you see it coming, you get to adjust your sales before the wind changes. But nevertheless, the economy. Number two, reason, the second reason is it could be your industry is changing uh, absent from the economy, separate from the economy. Number three, it's a random event inside your company or in your industry or in the world at large. For instance, if you were uh, selling product into the Ukraine uh, before the Russians invaded, after the Russians invaded, you weren't selling product into Ukraine anymore. Nothing you could have seen, done, or, or planned for that. That was a strictly a random event. The fourth region, reason that the rate of change goes down or up faster or, or slower than the economy is because of what you're doing inside the company. And, I, and that's where we're going to focus a lot of our energy today. Uh, in plain language, you could have screwed up. And if you've screwed up, you're going to see that your growth rate falls off much faster than the industry, much faster than the economy. And it's because of what you have done internally. Or you could be growing faster than the economy in your industry. There's something you're doing or not doing that's driving it. So using rate of change, we can quickly identify what's going on, why it's going on, and fix if something's broken or accentuate if something right is going on. But it all comes down to having a usable metric, and that metric is called rate of change, the quarterly and the annual, the 3 over 12 and the 12 over 12 rate of change. If we go to the next one, please, you see an example of, of how this works. See, the top two trend lines are the rates of change and the dollar amounts are at the bottom. So when those rates of change are pointing up like that, it's saying that the economy is on your side, the business cycle pressures are positive, and the dollar amount is going to continue to grow. So you plan for more growth. You have more people, more inventory, you have more things going on, and indeed that's exactly what happens. And then the rates of change start to go negative on you. While your dollar amounts, usually it's revenue, while your revenues are still going up, you begin to get a telltale that your rate of growth is about to change. Now, just strictly off of this, you can't tell whether it's going to just decelerate, flatten, or decline. That's where leading indicators and, and analysis comes in. But you do know there's a change happening. So instead of just planning more and more and more because you think growth is going to continue, you know that something has to adjust. And through in-depth analysis, you know what that change is going to be. Next one, please. So as those rates of change are signaling downside pressure, we knew we were heading into a great recession. We were telling all of our clients, great recession. Those internal rates of change were screaming it before long. We were below that zero line on the blue line on top. That's 12 over 12 rate of change. Below zero means we're sinking below year ago levels. Whenever the 312 is below that, the red line is below blue, more bleeding is going to occur, more bad things are happening. And if you remember, when you got to 2009 as an economy, uh, by then the, the, the world was pretty much moving towards panic. Uh, financial markets were in disarray, banks uh, were in disarray around the world, and businesses uh, were, became extremely negative. Uh, will this ever end? When will it end? What's going to happen? And then an interesting thing happened for this company. Their rates of change started to turn up. See that on top, how the red line moved above the blue line? That's a strong internal signal that says, hey, you're about to end your own personal recession here. Never mind what's going on in the world. You're about to see better days. You better start thinking about X, Y, and Z. And we'll talk about some X, Ys, and Zs before long. But you have a signal there, and things did get better. And then the next turn was signaled, and you can see that it, it moved down. But in each case, the rates of change told the leadership of this company well in advance of the turn that there was going to be a turn, and they had time to prepare. So I ask you, if you knew the Great Recession was coming, what would you have done differently? Or if you knew there was a nice recovery coming, what would you do differently? And with that knowledge, you're ready to act. And with that knowledge comes power, and the power to enhance profitability, build a better company. Uh, and it obviously comes down to messaging as well as the positioning as we go forward. All right, Art. Well, looking at the data, we can learn a lot. We can see a lot of what's happening with the companies. Um, we've also, as, as Chief Outsiders, we've actually been on the management team of over 300 companies over the last seven years. Um, about 100 of them are Vistage companies. And one of the things that we've identified or really um, kind of run across is this unusual fact that often the best run companies have the hardest time growing. And, and at first, it's a little hard to understand because one of the reasons we're all in Vistage, I mean, I'm a Vistage member, I'm in a CE group, have been for years, is that we're part of Vistage to learn how to run our companies better. Many of our, our speakers are about metrics and management and process and procedures 
repeatable results. But it often times out, or we found out over time that sometimes those best run companies are the hardest time growing. We've also find, found out that often those best run companies are the ones that are most affected by the economy. They're the ones that are whipsawed. If the economy's doing good, they're doing good, but if the economy's doing bad, they're they are really hammered. What we're really looking at it in detail, we realize that there's two different skill sets. Running a company is very, very different than growing a company. Running a company is about inside the four walls. It's the metrics, the management, the process, the procedures, the repeatable results. The things that we spend a lot of time in our Vistage group trying to learn how to do better and better and better. Unfortunately, those are different skills than growing a company. Growing a company is looking outside the company, not inside the four walls of the, the operations, but outside the company, at the marketplace, at the customer, at what's happening in the economy, and then being able to do something about it. We did this research study with the University of Texas a couple of years ago. It's what really brought this to light. Um, studying 200 CEOs and mid-sized companies, the researchers at the University of Texas, and these were three market research professors, not a student project, but three professors, were able to help us understand and identify that there's two types of CEOs. About 55% of CEOs and mid-sized companies are operationally focused. About 45% are market focused. Now what it is is that the operationally focused CEOs, the, the CEO and the, the management team generally come from engineering, finance, operation, or sales. All functions that are focused inside the building, inside the operations, delivering the product. Now at first we kind of question them and said, sales? I don't want sales inside the four walls. I, I, I want sales outside the four walls talking to the customer. Well, if you really look at the job of sales, the job of sales is very near term. It's to sell what's in stock this week, this month, this quarter. Whereas CEOs from these operationally focused or market focused companies, excuse me, the other one, their CEOs generally came from either marketing or IT. And here we kind of questioned and said IT. I mean, the IT department keeps the phone system running. It keeps the order entry process, the, the accounting system. How much more internally focused an organization can you get? And they said, no, 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 let's look at a CEO that came up through IT and is now the CEO of a company. That CEO probably spent their whole career looking at what's the next technology coming down the line? What's going to happen after software as a service? What's going to happen after the cloud? Should we be moving from a product to a service or maybe back to a product again? So the, the a CEO from, op, from marketing and operations probably spent most of their career looking out the window. When we look at these two, I'm going to compare the two because it really does affect how you lead your company and how you need to think about reacting to changes in the marketplace. But operationally focused companies are listed here on the left. They generally have an operationally focused CEO. Their management team is almost always also operationally focused. I mean, how many of you out there think about you or the other people in your Vistage group where there's an engineer running a company and most of the management team are engineers? Well, those companies were generally very satisfied with their results. They're growing at the industry growth rate, but they're not real satisfied with the future. These engineers run really good companies. When we asked them where growth would come from, they generally said acquisition. In other words, we run a really good company. Our best chance to grow is probably buy another company and run it. Well, the market-oriented companies were a little different. They weren't quite as satisfied with the future or with, or with their current results. They were very satisfied with the future. They saw great opportunities in new products and market expansion. One of the, the magical things, though, is we, we asked the researchers to go back and, and say, there's got to be more here. You know, if you tell me that engineers run really good companies, and marketers have great visions for the future but don't really get things done, that's not exactly new news. There's got to be some operationally focused CEOs who are excited about the future, who see opportunities to grow. And they said, yes, it turns out there is. When operationally focused companies exhibit some of the behavior of the market focused companies, they, they had the best reported growth rates. They were the ones that said, you know, we're, we're really good at process procedures, metrics management, but we see great opportunity to use some of that market behavior looking out at the marketplace to actually accelerate our growth. So one thing to think about for yourself, you know, who's running your company? If you're the CEO or if you're part of the management team, you know, are you an operationally focused CEO? And, and what does that mean about your skill sets? What does that mean about your management team? You know, are you a market focused CEO or have you been able to make that change from being an operationally focused CEO who's adopted some of the market behaviors?
And those are some of the behaviors we want to talk about, looking at the marketplace, deciding what to do next based on the market dynamics versus the internal operations of your company. Now, we, um, we look at this and we think about marketing as, as we, we identify in our book, The Growth Gears, as marketing and growth should not be the creative, cool, whiz-bang stuff. It's a logical, linear process. It's a process, a set of gears to drive growth. And the first gear starts with knowledge, insights. Insights into the customer, insights into your competitors, insights into your own company. And here's where that, that understanding of the economics takes a big part. Understanding of yourself in the company, in those 312s and those 1212s. That understanding needs to drive your strategy, your growth strategy, your business strategy, and that will drive the third gear of execution. Here's an example of, of how to think about strategy, and I really I use this example for two reasons. One is, well, it's a four-quadrant chart, and many of people refer to us as consultants, and quite frankly, as a consultant, if we don't have a four-quadrant chart, they, they'll take our license. So the other is it's, it's a, a pretty good, simple, under, simple way to talk about growth. Um, think about if you were a company that made wine glasses. You made really, really good quality wine glasses, and you sold them direct to consumers. Now, I doubt there's anyone in here, out here on the, the line today that makes wine glasses, but think about your own company. You can grow by focusing on the current customers you have and the current products you have. You make great wine glasses, you sell them direct, direct to consumer, you can continue to focus your growth on just doing that. Or you could say, we really understand this customer. What else could we sell this customer? What new product or service could we offer them? If this customer really likes fine wine glasses, maybe they want to buy other things like wine racks or wine aerators or charms or any of the other things that go associated with wine. You could take your current customer and sell them new things. Or you could say, we're really good at wine glasses. We sell them direct to consumers. Maybe there's a new type of customer out there, like restaurants. Restaurants use a lot of wine glasses. Maybe we could take our current product and sell them to a new type of customer. Well, moving from one type of customer to a new type of customer also has some challenges. If you're selling to restaurants, that's probably a very different sales cycle, sales channel, maybe even production logistics distribution process. But that's a significant way to grow. And then there's also this, this fourth quadrant. Um, you make really good wine glasses. So you say we're really good at understanding glass and making glass. Maybe we should sell beakers and test tubes into the pharmaceutical industry. That gets pretty risky if you're going to sell a new type of customer and a new type of product. The way we think about it is this lower quadrant is gaining share, gaining market share. You can have new offerings, new markets, or go all the way out to the edge. When we did this research, we found that most companies said they thought their best opportunity for growth was, number one, to differentiate, to continue focus on their current products and customers, number two, to go into a new business segment, three, improve the products, four, new products, or geography. Well, the reason I bring this example up now is, is again, let's think you're, you're this company selling wine glasses. Now, obviously, you don't sell wine glasses, but you could sell the same type of you could sell to that customer and sell them new things. What if you knew, what if you had really good understanding of the fact that the type of customer you're selling to, their business is going to boom for the next two or three years. They're going to be expanding their growth. They're going to have increased needs. They're going to have more cash flow, more buying power. That might lead you to say, let's stick with this customer and sell them other stuff. What else can we sell this customer? Because this customer is going to be doing great. Well, what about if you, got, if you looked at the information and you saw different news? What if you said, we sell into this type of customer, but this type of customer is going to be facing some headwinds. This type of customer is really going to be hurting over the next couple of years. Do you try and sell more stuff to that customer, or is that the time you say, you know what, we got to find a different type of a customer that might want to buy our stuff and then change the type of stuff and how we sell it? If you see that your customer is going to be facing some headwinds, can you find other customers, different types of customers, that are going to be facing, having a great tailwind, they're going to be booming, and then change your product and service? That's one way to think about how to use economic data to decide what to do, where to grow your company, versus just staying there, selling wine grasses, direct to consumers, saying, they don't have much buying power, we're going to have to just hide for a while. Alan? Ellen, you may be on mute. 
Thank you for that, Art. I, I did mute myself while you were talking, so as not to interrupt you. Thank you. Um, the blue part, uh, the what you see in front of you, uh, the four phases of the business cycle is phase A, the green is B, the yellow is C, the red is D. I do want to point out that the economy does not always go through A, B, C, and D in that order. You can go up in A and then go back down in D without ever having seen B and C. Nothing's as linear as a, as this this sine wave would, would make it seem, but it'll work for our purposes. And to, to Art's point, um, if you do this for your company as a whole, you will be able to position your company uh, appropriately when to step on the uh, and improve marketing, when to spend money on process, when to uh, hire, when to build inventory. And if you do it down at the segment level, uh, people who will be buying your product, uh, and you see that they're going to be moving into a the back side of the business cycle, into the yellow and red, which I'm going to describe in a minute, then you have time while you're on your way up to start thinking about, well, who else should I be selling to, and will that somebody else be moving in a different rhythm, a different pattern. So by seeing around the turns, you be begin to know when it's time for to look for something else. Let's go through that, and I'll give you an example. Phase A is when your sales, 12-12 rate of change, not the actual dollars, but the rate of growth, is moving off of a low. And as it's moving off of a low, the first half of that blue section, your sales dollars are generally reaching a low, and they'll start to move up in the second half. Now, in the psychology of things, your company is probably moving through a pretty pessimistic period still. They've been coming through a decline. Uh, things were bad. They still have a uh, cost-cutting, hunker-down, we should not get aggressive type of mentality, which as a leader in your company or as the leaders, you will be fighting as you go forward. But nevertheless, uh, you know that things are getting better because your rate of change is moving up and leading indicators are telling you that it's moving up. So you're hiring, and you're spending money on advertising and on marketing and all the things that you should be doing uh, in preparation for phase B. Phase B is when you're above year ago levels. That's the green segment. That's when things are best. You are busting loose. It is fun. Your problems are all positive. You need more. You need more people, more space, more product. You're, you're just anxious to come into work every day. And the danger there is that you're so focused on the operational aspects, which Art was talking about, that you lose sight of the marketing aspects, which he was also bringing to our attention. You and I can get so busy being successful in B that we, we almost guarantee that we're going to be moving into phase C, which is the yellow section, which is the slower rate of rise. At the top of B, you can quote Greenspan, it's unwarranted optimism. We just, just believe in our future. We believe we've got this figured out. And while we intellectually know there's a slowdown coming, most times people will say it's at least six months out. So we, we believe in a B future, and we step into phase C, things are slowing down. And when things are slowing down, by the way, the most common thing in the world is uh, we have found is for leaders to say it's the sales team. Something's gone wrong with the sales team. We better fix that. And they don't not look to the economy first. They don't look to their product offering. They don't look to see what's going on. They look internally. Remember, these are operationally minded folks to see what they should be fixing internally instead of having that outward view. If you knew that it was coming, you would have adjusted for it. Second half of phase C, uh, people are getting concerned. Uh, second half of phase C, your sales dollars are beginning to move lower. And then if things go wrong on you, you're into phase D, which is the red section, which means you're, you are in your own personal recession. Whether the economy is or not is another question, but you are in uh, your own recession. Things are going down. And if you're following the same customers day in and day out, you're going to move exactly in that pattern on a repeated basis because whether it's consumers, whether it's industry, whether it's machinery, whether it's medical, aerospace, it moves in those four phases uh, at some time. Now, let me give you an example of uh, somebody who did something differently. There is a company here in New Hampshire, and uh, they made a small, very, very small uh, device for the military that went on submarines. Well, submarine spending went in decline, and this company was facing oblivion. They were on their way out of business, and somebody inside there knew that they were on the backside of the business cycle. They just didn't know what to do about it, but somebody inside in marketing where they went outside and got a marketing person. I'm not exactly sure how that went. They said, you know what, uh, let's get out of this business and, and sell that little tiny high, uh, you know, in a submarine, resistant to vibration, resistant to corrosion, resistant to constant use. Where else can we use that? And they landed in the medical field. 
So they went from selling little parts to submarines in the U.S. Navy to selling these little uh, parts into the medical field around the world, and they transitioned themselves out of one economy into another. And it was a beautiful thing to do because they went uh, marketing-oriented instead of operationally-oriented. And as they did so, uh, they changed their own personal Phase D into a uh, Phase A, into a Phase B, separate from the economy because they were thinking differently. Now, the story doesn't end there because if you just continue with that mindset, you're going to sell that little part into a medical field that's going to succumb to pricing pressures because of Affordable Health Care Act and other things. So, again, you have to constantly be paying attention to, all right, now I'm on the right-hand side of the graph. I'm in my Phase B. I'm in the medical field. Uh, that's going to slow down. So what's my next customer? What's the next thing? And where are they in the business cycle? And you're constantly looking for other opportunities, other places to expand your offering or to add new product, as Art said. Another way to, to use this internally, by the way, would be to, if you're in a phase C or a phase D situation, take advantage of the pessimism that's out there. I love it when people are pessimistic. When people are pessimistic, it, 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 the opportunities abound, and the, the worse things are, the more opportunities there, there are out there. If you want to get a good piece of real estate, you wait until the industry that has the space you want, because not all space is the same. It might be an office building, it might be warehouse, it might be automobile, uh, maybe factory, whatever. You wait till it's in a phase C, phase D situation either. And you're buying from somebody who thinks, oh, the world's never going to get better. I might as well sell this thing. And you're going to buy it at a discount. And if you buy it in phase D, interest rates are also lower, by the way. So if you knew that situation was coming where you wanted to buy, let's call it uh, warehouse space, and you knew that warehouse space was going to be in, in a contraction mode because the economy was in a contraction mode because wholesaler distributors were going to be hurt and uh, negative things were happening in the economy, you knew that was coming because you used rate of change in a forecast, then you knew to save cash. You knew to get your banker ready. You need to, knew to be preparing a story so that when it happens, you're ready to act, you're ready to move on a piece of property, and you're going to save yourself a whole lot of money. Or it may be a lease. At the bottom of a phase D, when your landlord thinks that things are just going to keep getting worse, you renegotiate a lease. It doesn't have to expire. You just renegotiate it. And as you renegotiate at a trough, you're going to save yourself lots of money, real cash, for the next several years. So while the economy is getting better and your landlord's hitting his forehead with the palm of his hand going, why did I do that? You're smiling every month as you're saving money on that lease. By knowing what's coming, you position the company corporately on a governance basis, on a financial basis, and on a strategic basis. And as you look at those other markets, you have a really good handle on, on where to go. All right, did you want to add anything to that? All right, I think you may be the one who's muted at this point. Yeah, so I was muted on that one. We're <laughs> going to go in a minute. We're going to go through each of these cycles um, independently and talk about what do you look for, what do you do, um, what actions do you take? Because this whole workshop is really about when, you, when you're able to get the information about your company, when you're able to get the information about the economy, what do you do? And it's, it's that doing phase that's, that's so important. All right. Well, how about you bring us to the next one, then? We'll, this is a snapshot of the U.S. economy right now. And uh, while we're not here to talk about the economy, what this is per se, in our forecast per se, what this is telling us is that the different parts of the economy are in different phases of the business cycle. You can see that. Medical now is in phase C, financial segment. Retail is coming to the end of a phase C. Housing beginning to accelerate in phase B. Consumer prices, which means inflation beginning to accelerate in phase B. Etc. So you, you look at a graphic like this and you begin to time your decisions. And just as an economic update, when you see new orders, foreign housing, all beginning to climb that slope, you know things are getting better, by the way. That's one of the telltales. And retail sales, uh, that's in phase C only because gasoline prices have been so soft. If we took out gasoline prices, we'd see that retail sales were 4.1%, 4.2% above year ago levels, slowing a little bit, but much stronger than most people think. So, uh, again, uh, this is an example of you need to know what industry you're talking about because not everybody's in the same phase of the business cycle at the same time. A little additive uh, bonus for you. Uh, things are getting better. Next one, please. We use leading indicators. I've mentioned them a lot. And the, the fast takeaway here, because time is going quickly on us, is that the in leading indicator in green certainly tells the leadership of the company, which is in blue, what will be happening. 
Um, it tells you how well you perform to the economic indicator. If you look at 2009-10, you can see that the rate of growth in the company was only what the economy said would happen. The, the leadership did not outperform the economy. And as a matter of fact, when you look at 12 and 13, the company went down faster than the, econ the economic indicator. The green line said they should. So this company is an underperformer. Uh, a management team here needs to figure out why are they underperforming the economy as measured by this single leading indicator. And one indicator is never enough. You need five or six or seven to really get a gauge. But in our example, this is telling us of an underperforming company that is feeling more pain than they should given their historical relationship. Let's go to the next one, please. Oh, it's a walking chart. Very nice. Uh, steel scrap prices uh, compared to a leading indicator also telling us that you know you can see what's happening in commodity prices. Hint, hint, by the way, commodity prices are showing some upside activity despite uh, what you're looking at on this, on this particular chart. And once you know what commodity prices are doing, not only do you get a handle on what's happening in the economy, of course, if you're in the commodity space, uh, it has everything to do with your inventory, with your finances, and what your world's going to look like. So having key indicators here is obviously very helpful. And having rates of change in, in itself a key indicator to what will be happening, for instance, in steel scrap prices. Let's go to the next one, please. Okay. Uh, we're fine-tuning here. Uh, exact same A, B, C, and D, but now you take the different segments of construction and just construction, and you put them on A, B, C, D. So if I'm a contractor and I'm a commercial contractor, and I happen to have worked for years for a commercial contractor, so I have some experience in this space. Um, I was a company comptroller. Uh, when, you, when you look at what's happening in, in the different aspects, you know where to go send your salespeople. You know what kind of work you should be bidding on. You know where the profitable work is, where the more money is going to be spent. Uh, you, you're not going to spend your time on warehouse that's in phase C decline in terms of construction, much lower rate of growth and about ready to tip over. You're certainly not going to be chasing airport terminals and sports arenas, which are in phase D. By doing this as a contractor, I'm chasing education. I'm chasing hospitals. I'm chasing things that are, that are going to give me more opportunities, less competitors, and therefore more margin. So while we were at a macro basis, we've not now brought it down into an industry. And then from here, you can, you can break it down into a region. And you can even break it down into the county level if you want, so you know what to chase within certain counties, uh, whether it's HVAC or masonry or whatever field you happen to be in as a contractor. You can know, and you can be very specific in how you market uh, to those people. Thank you. Let's go to the next one. And actually, before we get off this one, I really want to point out that this is, is kind of one of the, the key elements, key concepts we're here to talk about. You know, we often hear the economy is doing X. The economy is going up. The economy is struggling. The economy is flat. Okay, that, that's interesting. Um, through looking at this information and by getting the right information, you can say, well, the economy is doing X, but what are the key indicators of the economy? That was the previous chart. And then all the way down to what are the customer segments that I might be into? Because the economy could be doing one thing, but, you know, being able to make a decision and do something different okay, my business is all being set around sports arenas and airports. I've got to figure out how do I do something different? Because if I'm just going to sit and wait, I'm going to get whipsawed. I'm going to be that company that just gets driven up and down by the economy and underperforms. It's by looking at the data, the big, the middle, and then the micro, that you can really make a decision about where to go, what to do. Thank you, Art. obvious question here is, where are you in the business cycle? Uh, it, as Art just led us to, it's one thing to know what the economy is doing. It's much different to know where you are fitting into this. Uh, if you're moving with the economy, are you moving with retail sales, or are you closer to non-residential construction? Where are you in the train called the economy? Do you lead? Are you in the middle? Do you lag? Uh, and knowing where you are allows you to start making decisions that are very relevant for you, separate from what you're reading about in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, The Economist, et cetera, because now it's actually your data. And with your data, you can act on what is best in your own best interest. And you begin to rela relate this to your own business. Next slide, please. So now we start talking about how do you make this actionable? Well, the first thing to do is try and relate it to your business. As the leader of your company, you have a basic under, you have an understanding now of the phases A, B, C, and D. Um, 
it's something that your company, your management team probably has the best information on. But it's something that it, it helps if you really discuss it, you bring that out in the open. Discuss with your management team, what phase are we in now? We, we've seen how to run the 1212s and the 312s. It's, it's really pretty simple to run, run that math. But also then, what phase do you think your customers are in? And almost more importantly, what do you watch out for to know if you're moving from one phase to the other? Hey, it's, it's great we're in phase A, it's great we're in phase B, but what should we be watching out for? Because you know we need to be able to change what we're doing, act or react differently as if we're gonna move from one phase to the next. So then what is the plan? If six months from now, if some months from now, we think we're gonna move from B to C, C to D, A to whatever, what would we do? It's better to plan ahead of time saying, what should we look out for? And if we see this, what are we gonna do? Then you find yourself in the situation going, wow, this isn't what we expected, now what do we do? Also, which of your customers are likely to be moving in the same way? Which customers are likely to be moving opposite directions? And then plan for it. You know, if we're gonna move from C into D, what would we do? That's different than if we're gonna move from C into B. So the idea here is, is to take some of this information, bring it to your management team and discuss. It's not just what the economy is going to do, where are we now, what do we watch out for, and then what would we do? Art, may I interject here before you go on? Uh, the, sure. The second bullet point you have here I think is phenomenal. What phase uh, are your key customer segments in? And, and down into the key customers, which is where you took us right before you, you turned the page, is it's really important because how you sell to people in different phases cannot be overstressed. If somebody's in phase D, you're selling to them entirely different way than you are if they're in phase B, where, where things are up and exciting. In phase D, it's all about how are you going to save the money? How are you going to protect them? How are you going to partner with them? In phase B, it's about how are you going to let them be able to do more, make more, and, and, and everything's geared towards excitement in phase B. So you're selling into optimism, which is an entirely different message than when you're selling into pessimism. And the trickiest part is probably in between when you're going from across that zero line on the way up where there, there's hope, but there's not a lot of proof. And on the way down, when they're, they're really concerned about the future, but they really don't know whether they're going to go into D or go back up into B. If you can help them navigate that and sell to, to where they are psychologically and where their future lies, you become a valued partner and, and you become somebody that they, that they look to. Uh, I had a, an example of that one I want to quickly share. It was a fellow in Wisconsin. It's a small company, but uh, part of GE was one of his 80-pound his, his gorilla, his one client, which is another story. And as he was bringing the economic information to this segment of GE, he became a very valued provider uh, to GE. He became uh, more of a, a close-in partner. And his business grew because of it. He became somebody adept at selling to where GE was in, into the business cycle uh, very successfully for quite some time. Uh, the end of the story is, by the way, he forgot to take his own advice and overbuilt in phase B, which is something that I know we're getting to, Art. But at the top of B, he started believing his, his own press about himself and spent all kinds of money and all kinds of expansion right at the top of the business cycle, which is almost a guaranteed way to face uh, you know, bankruptcy at the bottom of the next business cycle. And uh, that's exactly what happened to him. Thank you for letting me talk, butt in there. Sure. Um, so you may be asking yourself, okay, I, I understand the 312 to 1212. You have access to your own sales. You can measure that. You can look at some, some market things. You hear some market things about what's happening in the economy, but how do I know whether my customers in phase A or B, they're not giving me their sales data. How do I know whether my customers likely to move into C or, or D. Um, these are a couple of screenshots we captured from the ITR trends reports. You're not actually expected to try and understand the data on these pages. Um, but the ITR, ITR trends report comes out every month. It's, it's relatively inexpensive to um, subscribe to. We subscribe to it. I pay for a subscription. Because what it does is it, it helps you look at the economy overall and which elements of the economy. It starts out at the high level, the, the economy and the, the major indices. Where are they currently? If you look at the, the blue, green, yellow, red, based on phase A, B, C, and D, where are they going to be the rest of this year, 2017, 2018? More importantly, it's got a tremendous amount of detail about different types of customer segments. So I just held, I pulled up um, manufacturing. So manufacturing, if you can see, and again, it's, it's pretty small, but I mean, it's got details on U.S. metalworking new orders. Where is that going to be in 2016, 17, 18? 
U.S. Mach machinery new orders as a difference of metalworking machineries, construction machinery, electrical equipment, computer equipment, capital defense goods. Um, it's hard for you to get personally get information about what's happening to your customer's economy. A very inexpensive purchase of this trends report that comes out every month and you can quickly see which market segments are going to be moving in which direction. Should you focus on um, machinery orders, which looks like it's going to be yellow this year, red next year, and then green, or would it be better to actually look at electrical equipment, which is going from blue to green? Then there's also within each of these, U.S. metalworking, a whole lot more data. So the, the idea is in order to make decisions, you need information. When we talked about the, the three gears or the growth gears, it starts out with an understanding of your customer, your competitor, yourself. That needs to lead your business decisions. So that kind of leads us to the, these four phases. The phase A. If you understand that you're in phase A or your customer's in phase A, you know, what do you deal with? First off, what do you watch out for? We'll talk in a minute about what do you do in each phase, but there's cautions in each of these phases. In phase A, you watch out for fear to act, slow to respond. You've just probably come out of phase D where things have been really bad. Well, things are starting upward. If you didn't take the time to plan in phase D, if you aren't watching to know, yes, we're in phase A, you could be the guy left flat-footed sitting there, you know, still telling people you're going to save money, still pulling back and saving and not, not spending, not growing, um, when the market's already turned on. Where if you had understood what was going on, you could have been the first guy to react. Alan, what have you seen with companies in, in phase A? Pretty much exactly what you said. There's a fear to move because what if this is, in common language, uh, in our world and in, in finance, we call it, what if this is a dead cat bounce? And what if all those people who are really negative on the economy out there are actually right? And it's it, this is not popular to say, Art, but uh, the reality is it's much easier to die with the herd than to be in front of the herd. At least I'm safe, and my job is safe because as the CEO or as a senior VP or whatever, I can tell the board nobody knew, nobody responded. And therefore, as my company is hurt, it's because I was afraid to act, I was afraid to stand out. And we usually hear people cling to nobody could know. <laughs> That's the fun part, because you can know. And because of our track record, uh, you have an almost 95% confidence in, in what will be happening. So there's no reason to be afraid to act. It's actually a good time to be a bold leader, which is all Vistage is about with their VES this year is bold leadership. Uh, it takes some bold leadership because there's some risk, but when you reduce this uncertainty to 5%, it's probably a greater risk in not acting and just moving along with everybody else. And then the slow to respond is, is, that you have there is absolutely correct. Most people wait till they're almost at that zero line, about ready to cross over into B. But if you think of hiring, for instance, and, and how long it can take to spool a new employee up, the training process, if that's six months, you have to get them in place well before uh, you get to that zero line. You want them hitting the ground and running by the time you get to phase B. You don't want to be starting the process. You're going to lose six months out of uh, the best part of the business cycle. So you have to have uh, some boldness, and you have to have uh, the ability to, to act quickly uh, so that you can put your company into a position to, to do these things. It's, it's fun when people do it, and it's painful to watch others fail to respond because then they're just like everybody else. So, so phase B, the next phase, is really what's referred to as the best phase, the things to watch out for are the positive problems. The positive problems, like we've got so many orders coming in, our customer service is terrible. We've got so much business coming out, we can't deliver on time. We're, we, our customers need us so badly, they're pissed at us because we can't deliver. Those are positive, but they're problems. There's also the genius effect. We're doing so great, it must be because no matter what I do, I have the golden touch. Now, phase C, phase C is a little different story. Um, I'd actually, I know when economists think in, in linear terms, I, as a marketer, I would call phase C actually phase D because it's all about denial. It's no, 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 we're, we haven't slowed down. Our growth hasn't slowed down. It's pretend and extend. It's, it's not recognized. The, the thing to watch out for is not recognizing that your growth is slowed. And that also leads into phase D. Phase D which I think should be called phase C for courage. Phase D, the issue is failure to act, not pulling back fast enough and not planning for the future. So let's look a little more closely at, at phase A. Um, the recovery phase, a quote from Alan and Brian's book is moving into phase A, you have to change your thinking about money, change your thinking from hoarding 
from, from you know, protecting, from hiding, to really driving forward, moving quickly. It's also when you change your competitive advantage. You might have been talking about your software to your clients about, we can help you save money. We can help you be more efficient. We can help you. Now's the time when you may want to take that same software and start talking about, we can help you scale. We can help you grow. We can help you move forward. Understanding where you are and understanding where your customer is can change the things you're talking about and the way you go to market. I agree with you completely. In, in phase A, you know, you see some wonderful stories. Uh, just uh, one fellow comes to mind that bought a piece of equipment real early in phase A. He knew he was going into phase A or maybe it just started. And I was taking a tour of his facility, plastic injection molded facility, Vistage member. And I, and, and I love these things and these tours. And as I was in there, he, he, I was looking at this piece of equipment, and I noticed it wasn't hooked up to anything. There was no wiring, there's no hoses, tubes, and that sort of stuff. He says, uh, you noticed that, huh? I said, yeah. He says, I couldn't resist it. He said, that's a $200,000 piece of equipment. He says, I got it for $10,000 at auction. He says, I know I'm moving up. I know I'm going to need that in a quarter or two. And how could I say no to that type of pricing? So somebody let it go because they had to. This guy bought it and put it in place because he knew the future and knew that he was going to need it. And when I saw him a year later at the next time I ran into him, I said, how's that machine going? He big smile. He said, I'm making money every day <laughs> off of that thing because he had the, uh, the things that you list there. Uh, it, it was, those types of stories just make me smile. So phase A is definitely the time to implement the stuff you've been thinking about, moving into new markets, launching those new products. Now, phase B, the best part, is also something you can, um, obviously, business is booming. There's some things to watch out for, but then there's some real opportunity here. You, know, you, you have to watch out for slipping customer satisfaction. Um, but here's a time to really take time and look at your customer profitability. Look at price optimization. The best time to increase your prices is when you're having trouble keeping up with demand. The best chance to, to prioritize is when you say, all right, we're doing everything we can. Now, some of our customers are probably more profitable than others. Some segments are more profitable than others. Let's really focus where this growth is coming from this is a time to invest and build your brand. And most people will not do your last bullet point because they're so busy with fulfilling, fulfilling today's responsibilities, today's customers, that they won't begin those missionary efforts into new markets. I mean, that is so key. And it goes right back to where you started this conversation from, Art. We have to be able to do that if we're going to be successful going forward and avoid a lot of the pain of the backside of the business cycle. And then say C. That's the issue of denial. It's, it's don't be dismissive. Now, your revenue is still going up, but your growth rate has slowed. So the question is, don't, don't cut across the board. Understand what segments should you focus on. All of your customers are probably not moving in sync. There may be some that are still in A or B and some that are in C or D. Understand those customers, prioritize, and then plan. All right, what if this phase C turns into a D? What if the phase C turns into a B? This is a time to, to step back and say, okay, let's really understand, let's put these contingency plans in place. I agree. Uh, C is, uh, we use it, the, the word caution, uh, because uh, people need to be cautious about their activities, and, and I think that the don't be dismissive is, is absolutely key here. Uh, it, we tend to just kind of shrug it off. And you know what we often hear, and this is in the book too, is, well, we needed time to catch our breath. Um, that's a, the same as saying I need time to, to catch my breath before I go underwater for an extended period of time. You're much better off looking for the lifeboat. <laughs> uh, everything you said is absolutely true. And in preparation for phase D, you do things differently in C than if you're going to go back into B. Knowing which way you're going based upon lead indicators is absolutely key. Uh, while it is good to have a plan for both, you certainly want to be tilting your plans in one direction or another, uh, depending on what the leading indicators are telling you. So you can know with great certainty which way that's going. And that leads us to phase D, which we use D, by the way, because it rhymes with donkey, uh, which reminds me of Eeyore, Winnie the Pooh's little friend, because this is when CEOs and others start sounding like Eeyore. They'll, we hear things like, well, wasn't much of a company anyway. You know, they, <laughs> there's that whole feeling that there's no tomorrow. Why bother? What a mistake, you know. Uh, when instead it should be a time of, uh, yeah, let's go out and do things so that we can minimize this, get ready for the future, and take advantage of other people's pessimism. Three key elements to 
of phase D that should get leaders excited as opposed to depressed. And, and so this is the, the, the courage phase, the courage to act quickly. You may need to reduce workforce. And we all know, as painful as it is, it's better to do that sooner versus later. We talked earlier about negotiating expenses. If you know you're in D and you're about to move into A, extend those contracts. You can get a price reduction now. It's changing the value proposition. Before, you were talking to customers about how to help them grow, how you can help scale. Now you're going to talk to them how they can make them more efficient. Now you're going to maybe change your, your pricing terms because you want them to get it in now and they pay for it later. Um, it's also focusing on the profitable segments and then planning. What are we going to do? We're going to turn up. D will end. We're going to move into A. What can we be ready to put our foot on the pedal when we hit A? So we're, we're, unfortunately, we took quite a bit of time. We've got time for a couple of questions, but I'd say there's a couple of good um, resources available. The Growth Cures is the book that, that Pete Hayes and I wrote about marketing and growth. How do you take information and really do something about it to move your company forward? Um, we talked a good bit today about the Make Your Move book. That's the one that goes through the phases A, B, C, and D and, and the trends report. So let's um, understand we, we probably have quite a few questions to see if we can get a couple answered here. We do. This is Dave here. So let's just jump in with uh, one or two of them. We titled this uh, 2016 The Economic Paradox. So I'd ask either Art or Alan to address um, what uh, really do you see that paradox being? Or feel free to blame, blame Brian for this one. <laughs> I think the paradox is a lot of people are tied up into the last quarter and the quarter before where things were soft. And uh, they're in that mindset. Uh, but what they really should be looking at are those leading indicators, including commodity prices, which are saying there's a better tomorrow. So while everything that they've just lived says, you know, hold back, everything that they should know says to go forward. And that puts leaders in a quandary. And obviously we're forward looking and think they should go because they know. Great. We had another. Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Art. I'd say it, it's, it's a difficult job to lead, and it's a difficult job to lead when the, the press keeps saying, you know, oh, this is terrible, oh, this is good. Both sides are saying it. There, there's information available, and the worst thing to do is just sit and keep trying to run your company and keep your head down because you'll just get whipsawed. Perfect. I want to uh, throw at you a question, and I'll ask either one of you to answer it uh, from um, one of our listeners, John, and um, I'll just say B as uh, – uh, boy, last initial, because I'm sure I would mispronounce the name. But the question is one that I think is interesting to everybody. Uh, understanding, obviously, there's variance. Uh, is there some average time frame for this business cycle? How long does it typically take to move A, B, C, D, just so that we have sort of an ex expectation, or, or is there not a typical? Uh, there is a typical. Um, and it will vary some depending upon the industry that you're looking at. It will vary some depending upon where we are in a larger business cycle. So I, I hesitate to give you the, a specific answer because that specific answer will vary uh, reasonably based upon industry and where we are in a larger cycle. But it is measurable. Uh, and a, in round numbers, a typical trough-to-trough -trough business cycle will be uh, three to four years. Okay, interesting. And again, I guess it gets you against that expectation. Just watch the numbers. And then one last question, because we are right at the uh, top of the hour, the amount of time we um, schedule for folks. Um, Glenn Malone asks an interesting question, so I'd just be uh, curious about either of your thoughts on it. How do you take advantage of a coming growth phase? So your D are moving into business cycle phase A, and you're in a capital-intensive business, and financing isn't really available in those phases. What are your thoughts? Well, as you're moving from D into A, your credit department should be uh, look, trying to be more creative, uh, trying to be a little more lenient, looking for those financing sources who uh, do have more open um, doors, more friendly uh, welcomings. They exist. Uh, they may not be a traditional. They may not be the ones you've been dealing, doing business with, but they, they are out there. And other than that, it's, it's, it's about pricing. It's about your, your marketing. How can, uh, how can you not afford to do this uh, type of thing and, and help them make the effort? Having said that, I know that's half an answer. 
because I know the difficulty that they're talking about and it's real, which is why you have to be planning your own cash flow as you head into D and into A so that as you know that that whole sales cycle has been slowed down from, let's assume it was three months and now six months, maybe six months has become a year and a half, that because you know that you've done your own internal planning because you, you recognize that there's only so much you can do in that, in that circumstance, you better have prepared for it internally. Art, some final thoughts? I would just add to that, you know, look at the specific types of customers. Um, most companies sell into a couple of different types of customers. The ones that are going to come out first, um, the ones that are likely to be the most profitable, you know, focus on those. Um, if you're coming off of D, you may have extra, excess capacity that you can now quickly fill up by pushing that, that sales and marketing engine. Drive, but drive with a purpose. All right, with that, uh, let's bring it to a close. We clearly could have gone uh, at least another hour <laughs> given this topic, but uh, I want to point out to folks uh, looking at the screen or looking at a video of the recording, uh, there are some resources that Art and Alan have left us with. I'll just do it via voice in case you're audio only. Uh, the Growth Gears, available as an Amazon bestseller. That's from Art Saxby. And Prosperity in the Age of Decline, among some other great books from Alan Bolio and the ITR Economics Trends Report. So with that, uh, Art and Alan, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. All right. Thank, thank you very much. much. All right. And, folks, please join us again for our next webinar. That's going to be on Friday, April 29th, so uh, two weeks. Taxes are done or extended. And uh, Dennis Najjar, the co-founder of accountingdepartment.com, is going to discuss job costing, the nitty and the gritty. As always, you can register at vistage.com forward slash FWV, as in Fridays with Vistage, and that's a public site, so you can bring your folks or uh, any professional associates you'd like to introduce to Vistage and some of this content. And you can always access past recordings roughly by the Wednesday after the live event at vistage.com slash webinars, and there's an extensive library there. So on behalf of Art Saxby and Alan Bolio and the entire team at Vistage International, I'm Dave Nelson. Thank you for joining us today, and have a great weekend.